Hi everybody, I'm Dan Wells. I write horror, fantasy, and science fiction, and I talk about games on the internet. Today I want to talk about one of my very favorite parts of the Pendragon RPG, which is the Book of Feasts. Uh, the feasts in uh, Pendragon can be a huge part, and in my campaign that I ran, they were a massive part of the game. Uh, the Great Pendragon campaign, which we've talked about before, goes through year by year and describes the events that happen every year. And one thing you will notice as you read through that is that there are two major feasts. Uh, one at the beginning of winter called the Christmas Feast, and then one at the end of winter called the Easter Feast. And uh, those are kind of a big deal. They are super valuable for a game master as well because they are the chance to make sure that the characters have an opportunity to meet the important NPCs to learn about the important stuff that's going on and the events and the wars and so on. If there's just going to be a battle, then yeah, you're, the Lord can call the characters in and say, hey, everybody, we're summoning you to battle. But uh, if you want to have the kind of political intrigue, you want to give them a chance to uh, meet and flirt and uh, court spouses, uh, then feasts are just super important for that reason. But how do you run a feast? It would be relatively easy to just say, okay, uh, now you're all eating anything you want to do. And in my experience, most of the time, the characters are like, uh, no, I think I'm good. Um, I don't have to do anything. And so that puts a lot of the work on the game master's shoulders to say, well, okay, here's this other opportunity. Here's this person you could talk to. Here's all these other things going on, right? Uh, what the Book of Feasts does is it puts a lot of those tools into the player's hands. And it, uh, I, I want to say that it kind of formalizes the procedure a little bit um, in a way that uh, kind of gives the characters a lot more agency over what's going on. Anyway, let's talk about it. The Book of Feasts is uh, written by James Knevitt and David Larkins. And it comes with this incredible deck of cards. See this? Uh, this is big, huge, thick deck of cards. And it's super awesome and valuable. We'll get to the cards in a minute. But first, first thing you do with a feast is you figure out how large the feast is going to be. And as an example, they offer um, a couple of different... Sorry, i got to find it. Okay, different sizes. So, for example, if it is the wedding of a vassal knight, which would be like a player character, then it is a two-round feast. Um, if a neighborhood tournament, like everyone's getting together for jousting, and then you're going to have a big feast at the end, three rounds. Uh, the Easter feast at Serum, which is the uh, kind of the seat of Salisbury where the Earl lives, and where most of your game will take place if you're doing uh, the Great Pendragon campaign, that's a four-round feast. And something like King Arthur's Pentecost feast is a full-blown five-round feast. Okay? So, what do the rounds do? Well, before we get to that, once you've decided how big your feast is going to be, then it is time for everybody to make an appearance check. Appearance is one of the core stats of the game. doesn't come up very often, in combat or in things like that, uh, but in feast terms, it's super important because this is going to determine where you sit. Uh, in a medieval feast, they had, you know, each table had salt, but how good was your salt? How dirty was your salt? How pure and clean was your salt? These are very important things, and was a th th this was a primary marker of social status as well. So everyone makes this appearance check, and if you get a normal success, that means you are seated near the salt, which means the pretty good salt that uh, you know the the nice white stuff uh, that doesn't have other weird rocks and dirt in it. That you get to sit near there. If you make a critical success, you are seated above the salt, which means you're at the high table. You're sitting there with the duke or with the king or with whoever's in charge, okay? You might not be next to them, probably almost certainly won't be next to the king himself, 
but you will be next to important people and you'll have a chance to talk to any of the people who are at that table. If you fail this appearance check, then you are seated below the salt, which means that you are down with the poor people, the squires, the commoners, right? And if you fumble this check, you get the absolute worst roll you can get. That is called, uh, well, first of all, that's just called a fumble, and you immediately will make a second appearance roll, and then wherever you sit, you actually sit one level lower than that. So critical success means near the salt, normal success means below the salt, and a failure means that you are seated on the floor. And so you have to sit down there literally just with the servants, and it's a sign of massive disrespect. And it's a, you know, it's a huge thing. You will lose honor. Um, but there are lots of different ways you can handle this. So uh, first of all, no matter where you sit, you can choose to sit one level lower, give up your seat to somebody else as a way of gaining some glory and honor. But that requires a special courtesy check because if you do it wrong, then everyone can tell you're being disingenuous about it and then you actually lose some honor. Um, if you're seated, seated on the floor, there's a chance to kind of turn that around and make yourself look very humble, or there's a chance to just make yourself look like an absolute jerk, uh, or you become a laughing stock and lose some glory and honor that way. So anyway, once you figure out where you're seated and you know how many rounds there are, let's say that this is the Easter feast at Serum, you've got four rounds. During each of those rounds, you have four choices. Okay, wait, before we explain the choices, let's talk about geniality. During a feast, you track geniality, which is kind of a, a an ever-increasing or sometimes decreasing bonus that will determine how good you are at the various courtly skills. Okay? And if you are seated above the salt, you get one free geniality. You get two free geniality every round, at the end of each round. And if you are seated near the salt, you get one. And if you're seated anywhere else, I mean, below the salt, you don't get any, and on the floor, you lose one geniality every round. And so, now it's time for you to make a choice, okay? And your four choices are, four choices, you can flirt, you can indulge, you can gossip, or you can draw a card, okay? Uh, indulge basically means that you are going to eat or you're going to help other people eat. So you get to, you know, Pendragon has the paired traits. So indulgent and temperate are opposite each other. And you can pick which one you're going to roll on. And if you say, you know what, I'm just going to eat and I am going to drink and I'm going to be merry, then you will make an indulge roll. And uh, that it has an opportunity to make you better at that to change or improve your traits. It uh, can get you drunk. It can help you, you know, impress other people. Uh, if you decide to roll temperate, then what you're doing is forgoing your own food to make sure everybody else has all the food and wine that they can possibly eat. And then, you know, similar opportunities. If you want to flirt, flirting is an important thing. And flirting, it should be noted, culturally in a lot of the Middle Ages, and particularly in the Pendragon game, is not necessarily um, done with romantic intention, which means that even if you are married, you can flirt. Uh, even if you are working with, you know, even if you are courting someone, you can flirt with someone else. That might make her jealous and that might, might cause problems for you. But flirting is just a way of talking to other people. And you can take that as far as you want. And the game absolutely does have, during the winter phase, childbearing roles. So you might end up with some illegitimate children if you take your flirting a little too far, but you absolutely can, and that's part of this whole medieval feasting vibe of this. So if you are in a position where you are unmarried and you're looking to become married, flirting is a really valuable way of meeting the right people and making sure that your line can continue and that you have someone to run your household and all of these things. And of course, you know, love. Um, gossip. Gossiping is one of the primary values of a feast. And so when you get to someone, if you say, if, like I said in the beginning, if all you're doing with, the, with a feast is saying, okay, you're here at the feast, what do you want to do? 
they often don't know what to do. Whereas if you say, okay, you are seated below the salt, down with the common people, and you know, you have a chance to gossip, well then they'll think, well, who, who am I near? And what can I do to make sure that I don't get seated below the salt next time? Um, you know, do, is there someone down here that I want to talk to? Is there some specific gossip that I can learn? And it helps focus things a little better. And then, of course, always at the end of the day, uh, if, well, I shouldn't say always, if you're seated above the salt, you're not allowed to draw a card because you've got important people that you can talk to up there. But if you're seated anywhere else, you can draw a card. So, for example, let's say you choose to draw a card. Let's flip this around. This says, insult to a serving girl. This uh, number in the corner says geniality. This was not gonna gain you any geniality. But what it says is, a knight slaps a serving girl, you see others turn away in embarrassment. And then you have an opportunity to roll just or arbitrary, which are one of those paired traits. Uh, if you roll just, it says, and, and just wins, you intervene. Your cup and trencher now runneth over Gain plus five to indulgent until the end of the feast, and gain two geniality. If arbitrary wins, you ignore the situation and turn away, and you get a check to indulgent, which means your indulgent will possibly go up at the end of the year, and you will change your statistics over time. Uh, and so this is just kind of an interesting option, you know? And what it does is it focuses things, and this gives you a chance to role play. If your character wants to intervene and says, hey, well, you, you force them to play it out. Say, you, you want to intervene? What does that look like? And the knight says, well, uh, I'm going to go tell that knight not to slap a serving girl. At which point the knight says, what? She's just a serving girl. Culturally, no one was nice to servants in the Middle Ages. Um, you know, I, it's, it's my right as a knight to uh, treat peasants any way I want to. And so this turns into a whole thing. It could end up in a duel. It could end up with you earning an enemy. It could end up with you earning an ally, depending on how you play it. And then, of course, the servants love you because you defended a servant. They start filling your wine and your trencher with food. And then possibly also they will give you a chance, you know, to uh, gossip later and they can tell you some juicy tidbits. Uh, there's so many scenarios that can spin out of just this one card. Let's flip over to another one. Oh, also you've got plus two geniality. Let's say that you're seated near the salt. So at the end of the round, you have your two geniality from this card, plus the free one you get every round for, uh, for just being seated near the salt. Um, so I want to find the, uh, the courtly skills list. Okay. Geniality modifies your appearance, and it modifies any courtly skill for the duration of the feast. The courtly skills are uh, comprehensively listed as compose, which is like writing poetry or songs, courtesy, dancing, falconry, flirting, gaming, heraldry, intrigue, orate, play an instrument, romance, singing, or tourney, which is one of the uh, you know tournament skills. And so, what we would often see in our campaign is that the players, you know, in a nice four-round Easter feast, uh, you know. Especially if, because Easter Feast is often the first thing you do in a year, uh, because you've just finished the winter phase, maybe your wife passed away, and you need someone to raise your children and someone to comfort you in your sadness, and so it's time to start flirting. Well, maybe you will blow a couple of rounds doing cards because you want to build up that geniality. And so now we've got, you know, Round two, we start with plus three to all of those skills, including flirt. But maybe I want to do a little more. Maybe I want to try to boost that up a little bit. So I'm going to draw another card. And it says, manners. You unexpectedly pass wind while a host or an important guest is speaking. And this gives you a courtesy roll. So some of these are traits and some of them are skills. If you get a critical success, you are adequately abashed. The speaker finds it funny and you gain geniality. If it's a normal success, you excuse yourself graciously. There's no effect. If it's a failure, people around you disapprove. You lose two geniality. And if it's an outright fumble that wasn't just wind, you leave to change clothes and you miss the next round. Oh no, we're really trying to impress a girl. How is this going to happen? And so then we roll our courtesy and let's say that we, you know, we just get the normal success. Okay, nobody cares. So we still have those three geniality. We get one free one because we're near the salt at the end of the round. 
Uh, and so we're good. If we'd have rolled a fumble, we'd miss the third round and possibly miss our chance to flirt altogether. So then next round, we're like, okay, it's time to flirt. Who's there? And the GM can tell you who the different kind of eligible uh, bachelorettes are in the room and uh, you know what your opportunities are to go around and flirt and then try to get married. Or you could just draw another card and it'll be something like, popular you are popular tonight everyone seems drawn to do drawn to you keep this card while you go, do gain two geniality per round so there's you get two geniality and then you're going to get two more geniality per round and if you roll a success on proud or a failure on modest you must discard this card because the adulation begins to go to your head so there's so many opportunities with these cards the deck is enormous we did one or two feasts per session when I was running this campaign, and we barely made it through even a fraction of the deck because there's so much to do. It uh, adds so much texture and flavor to a feast. It helps the, it adds a lot of structure to it, but in a way that gives the players options rather than takes those options away because it gives them ideas, it gives them suggestions. If they don't know what to do, they can just draw a card, and it'll be something like, Gossip, you overhear some interesting conversation. Okay, well then now you've just learned something, and in later rounds, you can act on that, or you can decide to share it with somebody else, or you can use it to try to impress somebody uh, in a flirting role, or in another gossip or an intrigue role. So there's so many ways that uh, the Book of Feasts and the Feast deck make feasts and therefore your entire campaign so much more interesting and so much more fun. Uh, it is one of my absolute very favorite parts of this game. And so, let's see, if I were ranking in order of importance, you buy the core book, you buy the campaign book, and then you buy the feasts book before you need a state, before you need entourage, before you need Book of Battle, before you need any of the other things, in my opinion, Book of Feasts is that next and first most indispensable supplement. So anyway, uh, this has been great. I, I'm glad I got a chance to, to show you this incredible deck and this incredible feat, uh, feast system. Uh, the book of Feasts contains a ton more information, by the way. There's an entire chapter two that just describes what medieval feasts are like and gives you some advice on, you know, what happens if a character gets drunk and all that sort of thing. And then there's a chapter three, which is an entire scenario that you can run, a little mini adventure to insert into your campaign. Uh, but the whole book is great. The deck is, is invaluable and uh, I love it. So thanks for joining me for this review. Um, I just want to give a shout out to a couple of my other projects. I am the game master for a D&D campaign on Twitch called The Gods of Veyron. That is Typecast RPG is the Twitch channel to look for us. I also run games online for people. If you're interested in having me run a game of Pendragon or any of the other games that I've reviewed or even just something that I haven't talked about but you think is cool, shoot me an email or contact me here and we can see if we can set something up. Uh, anyway, you're awesome, and uh, go buy all my books, but also, especially, go check out this feast deck and buy that. Anyway, goodbye!